Welcome to the first ever uh, Modern Day Disciple video blog. So this morning I was working on uh, making a post and by the time I got midway through it and realized that it was already way too long, I thought I should probably just uh, switch this on over to a video blog. So I say all that to say that I just woke up, so my hair is a mess and I have no makeup on. Uh, but that's okay because the Lord loves us anyway, right? So without further ado, I'll just jump into this here. So I'm reading in Numbers and I come across a, a uh, oracle spoken by Balaam that says, uh, God is not man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and then not fulfill? The simple, simple answer to that is, is no. No, he does not speak without acting. No, he does not promise without fulfilling. But that isn't the point here today. So let's unpack this. What exactly is happening here? Okay, there's two men involved in this story. Their names are very close, so you're going to have to pay attention. One of them is Balaam. Okay, Balaam is the son of Boyer. And I didn't know who he was, so I had to look him up. And uh, it's interesting. He is one of seven prophets who are specifically prophets to heathens. Okay. So the other gentleman in the story, his name is Balak. Right. Balak is a Moab prince. He is the son of, uh, of the Moab king. And I don't know his name right now. Uh, so to basically kind of get the understanding of what's about to happen here is we have Balaam who, it doesn't say that he's a prophet in the beginning of this, um, you know, in this, it was common, uh, in olden days that people relied on oracles and they weren't necessarily, uh, prophets of the Lord because they used a lot of sorcery in, forming their opinions, but his father was a prophet. So we know that Balaam has been exposed probably to both worlds. He's been exposed to uh, the sorcery side of oracles and all of that, but he's also been exposed to the side of the spirit of the Lord, where the Lord is just speaking through you and it's a different act. Uh, so we have him and we have Blalick here. And so Blalick is a Moab prince. We saw uh, before this point that Israel is kind of settling into the land. They're like taking over, they're killing entire nations, and they are, they're just really kind of moving in at this point. So the Moab, Moab people are like, whoa, okay? A, there is a bajillion of these people. They are way too numerous. And because they are so numerous, they are so powerful, and we don't know what we're going to do, right? So Blaylock is like, well, let's summon Balaam to come down here and put a curse on these people, and then maybe, just maybe, we can defeat these people, right? So here's what we need to know about Blaylock going into this. He is a prince. Everything is at his disposal, and you say, I say that to say basically that for him, there's nothing that money can't buy. For him, no is not a word that's in his vocabulary. For him, he wants it, he gets it, right? So he's really expecting uh, this, this gentleman to come down here and do exactly what he's asking. So what happens here? Blalock summons Balaam and he tells him, he sends some princes to him, and he says, you know, these these people of Jacob are too numerous. There, you know, there's so many of them. Come and put a curse on these people so that I might defeat them. So Blalem goes and uh, and he inquires of the Lord, and the Lord says, you know, uh, a people. He Balaam says to God. Blalak, son of Zippor, king of Moab, sent me this message. A prophet has come out of Egypt, a people has come out of Egypt and covers the face of the land. 
Now come and put a curse on them for me. Perhaps then I will be able to fight them and drive them away. But God said to Balaam, Do not go with them. You must not put a curse on those people because they are blessed. So Balaam gets up the next morning and he tells them, Go back to your own country. God has refused to let me go with you. So it gets confusing in that because then we see Balaam is actually inquiring of the Lord. But we're going to see later uh, where it talks about his sorcery. So the princes go back to uh, Balak and they're like, you know, Balaam refused to come with us. So he sent some other princes. More numerous, more distinguished, right? He's going to pull out the big stops now. We're going to send in the important people that are going to influence your decision to come. Hang on to that. So he sends them. They come to Balaam and they say, you know, this is what uh, Balak says. He says, don't let anything keep you from coming to me because I will reward you handsomely and do whatever you say. Come and put a curse on these people for me. I will do anything you want. I will give you anything you ask for if you'll just do this for me. Does that sound familiar at all? I'm going, I'm going to blow the surprise. I'm pretty sure those are almost the exact same words. That Satan said to Jesus in the uh, in the wilderness. I'm just saying, foreshadowing here. So uh, Balaam responds with, you know, well, even if Balak gives me his entire palace filled with gold and silver, I could not do anything great or small to be go beyond the command of the Lord. So he tells them, go ahead and stay here. Stay overnight like the others did. And I will go inquire of the Lord and I will let you know what he says in the morning. So he does that. And uh, kind of much to the surprise of the story, God just like flips the script, right? He's like, well, you know, since these men have come to summon you, go with them, but do only what I tell you. All right, so he goes with these men and then it kind of breaks off here and it tells this whole story about a talking donkey and uh and it's interesting uh so god was very angry when balaam went and he sent an angel to stand in the road and oppose him balaam was riding on his donkey and his two servants were with them the donkey keeps seeing this angel and diverting right so first it is that uh, he goes through this narrow path and with walls on both sides so the donkey sees the angel he pressed close to the wall crushes Balaam's foot so he hits her right and then the angel of the Lord moves on and stood in another place uh, where it wouldn't give the donkey room to turn either to the right or to the left And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down. So Balaam was angry and beat her with his staff. But then the Lord opens the donkey's mouth and says to Balaam, What have I done to you to make you beat me these three times? If I'm Balaam, I'm like, excuse me? Uh, did you just speak? Really? Really? I'm kind of freaking out, but we don't see that here. I'm guessing that he's in such a fit of rage at this point that he's so angered that this doesn't even register to him. That, um, excuse me, a four-legged beast is speaking to you right now, questioning your authority, right? So I love this. So he says to the donkey... You have made a fool of me. If I had a sword in my hand, I would have killed you. Right? And so the donkey says, you know, well, am I not your donkey, the one in which you have always ridden to this day? Have I been in the habit of doing this to you? To which Balaam responds, no. Oh, realization. Something is going on here. So then the Lord opens his eyes and he sees the angel of the Lord standing in the road. 
So he bowed and he fell down face first. And the angel says to the Lord, or the angel of the Lord says, Why have you beaten your donkey these three times? I have come here to oppose you because your path is a reckless one before me. The donkey saw me and turned away these three times. If she had not turned away, I would have certainly killed you by now, but I would have spared her. Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned and I did not realize you were standing in the road to oppose me. Now, if you are displeased, I will go back. And the angel of the Lord reiterates to the man to go with the men, but only speak what I tell you. And so that's what he does. He goes with them. Now, why why the the random story of the talking donkey kind of in the in the middle of this narrative and i have to wonder because of what is coming this is almost like a foreshadowing so remember the stuff with the donkey because we're going to come back to it remember that it was three times and that the donkey seemed to know the path but the Rider, the one in charge, was blind. Okay? Just hang on to that little string and we're going to come back to that. But also remember this. Okay? If the Lord will use a donkey to get your attention, he can and will use whatever means necessary. So, don't become blind. Leave yourself open. If God needs to get your attention... He is not above using a donkey. Now, I would hope that we might be a little more aware of the fact of how odd that is and really take it to heart a little quicker. So, anyway, what is going on? Uh, Balaam gets to the palace. He gives Balak very, Balak very specific instructions about what he's to do. He's to set up seven altars. He's to put on a specific sacrifice. And then Balaam will go and uh, inquire of the Lord. So that's what happens. He goes uh, and inquires of the Lord, and you know he's there to curse Israel, right? That is the mission. That is what uh, Balak, Bala, I don't know how you say his name, okay? So I'm just going to say it however I say it, and I'm going to call him Balak, okay? Balak. I like Balak better. We'll go with that. Okay, so... Balak wants him to curse the Israelites, right? They're wanting them out of the land. They are completely terrified. They don't want them here. So this prophet, this man who speaks to the Lord, sets up these instructions. Balak follows through with them. Balaam goes and inquires of the Lord. And what happens here? The Lord blesses Israel. Right? So, we go through this a few times. Rewind, repeat. We go through this three times. Okay? Three times the same thing. Uh, I think it's important here to note that the first time was in the presence of most of the Israelite camp. The second time, Balak thought it would be better to take Balaam where he could only see part of the Israel camp. But by the third time he's asking Balaam to inquire, he takes him to a spot that's overlooking the wasteland. No Israelites at all. And so I think, I think that that's interesting because it shows levels of separation. It kind of shows the enemy's plan, right? Like when you're in the assembly of like-minded people, of people of the same community, of people of the same faith, working toward the same goal, it's a whole lot easier for you to stand firm in that because you have this vast army of people who see things the way that you do, believe the way that you do, and are working toward that common goal. Right? So that's a little more difficult to persuade somebody away from. Okay. Balak isn't a stupid guy. He sees that, right? So he's going to take him, all right? Now I'm going to kind of pull in the thread of the donkey here. And this is the first this is the first time, right? Narrow path crushing the leg of Balak, right? He's not really liking this. 
So he takes him to a second location where he can't see all of the Israelite camp. Uh, he says specifically, come with me to another place where you can see them. You will only see a part of them, but not all of them. And from there, curse them for me. Right? It's a little bit, it's a little bit easier when you don't have the whole, right? You think this just immediately brings to mind for me <clears throat> the setting of a high school hallway. Okay. Transport yourself back in time or just like play out the scene in front of you, depending on what stage your life is at. And imagine a hallway and a band of mean girls, right? A whole <clears throat> a whole pack of them, right? There's several. And they're all so snooty and mean. And you're the new girl, right? And uh, they're just, they're rude to you, right? They're super mean. And you're like, oh, I feel so bad about myself. So then later, you see a subgroup of the mean girl group, right? So where maybe there's seven of them all together. Now you're only facing three, okay? And those three are... You know, they're nicer, they're not as intimidating, there's less of them, you don't feel as obligated to save face or to behave a certain way, it's okay, right? Okay, I can do this. And then, you've been there for a while, right? And you make some friends, and you're, and my, my high school was big, right? So there was like a, an area overlooking the cafeteria, right? So maybe you stand up there in the balcony area and you observe this wasteland where all of these people who were so intimidating to you and now it's like there's nothing and, and now you don't have a problem running your mouth, right? Same kind of deal here. That is where his mind was at. So he's going to pull uh, Balaam away from all of the things that are going to remind him that you know, he's going to do what the Lord says. And so, but nothing changes, right? He goes to the third time and he still blesses Israel. So Balak was really expecting his influence to have, to have a weight here. You know, he says to him, am I not able to reward you? Like I can give you anything that you want. I will give you all of this land and all of these people and all of these things and all of its glory, said Satan to Jesus, just saying. So he, you know, he's not, he's not really getting this. He's, so he's like, okay, you know, he's gonna, he's gonna appeal to his flesh. He's gonna appeal to his greed with, am I not able to reward you, right? But Balaam doesn't really fall for this. So then Balak is like, well, come to this place where you can't see them, right? And Balak, Balak is manipulating Balaam at this point. You can't do it in front of all, but I bet you'll do it in front of some, right? You will only see part, but not all of them. And from there, curse them for me. This time, Balaam returns with a message from the Lord that lets Balak know Balaam is not acting on his own accord. And God is the man that is in charge, that God is the man that does not change. And he is, in fact, in charge here. So Balak is losing his mind at this point. Like, I could just see him throwing just a tantrum. Like, he's having a complete fit. And he says, well, fine then. Neither curse him or bless him at all. And so then that's where it says something interesting. And it says, now when Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel... He did not resort to sorcery as at other times, but turned his face towards the desert. And Balak falls off the cliff, basically. Because once again, in the third oracle here, God blesses Israel. Now, I want to take you back to the donkey for a second. That says, why did you hit me three times? Am I in the habit of doing this to you? 
Is this normal? No, maybe I'm trying to tell you something, right? Well, here we go with God, Balak. He does the right thing in inquiring of this oracle of the Lord, even though he's using sorcery, and I'm not quite sure how all that works out, but I'll look into it. He inquires of, so basically he's asking of the Lord, right? And he asks of the Lord, the Lord tells him, no, I'm not going to curse these people. These people are blessed, right? So that was strike one. Balak sends Balaam to question him again. And he says the same thing. Why are you striking me again? I've already said no. I'm not cursing them. They are a blessed nation, right? Strike two. And then he does it yet again. Strike three, right? And here's where we kind of see that you know, Balaam recognizes that it's the Lord, right? He recognizes the message. He recognizes that uh, this is pleasing to the Lord and submits to it where Balak does not, right? And he, you know, why did you stroke me three times? And so it's, it's like that of the donkey, right? Like God is clearly trying to tell you something. He's trying to get your attention. He's saying the same things over and over. This is not a common thing for you. Listen, listen, listen. And so that's what he does. He, you know, Balak gets all mad. He falls over the edge. I invited you here to curse my enemies, but now you have blessed them three times. Now leave it once, right? And then I love this. He says, I would have rewarded you, but your God has kept you from being rewarded. I read this story and I think so much about how our lives today, so many thousands of years later, play out exactly like this. We inquire of the prophet that is Jesus Christ through the reading of this word and through the messengers in which he has set up that are teachers and prophets and evangelists and pastors and all of these other things. And we inquire of the Lord and the Lord responds. And most of the time, if we're honest, his response isn't what we want because our nature is to be selfish and we want what we want when we want it, right? So when the Lord says no, or this is the way, walk here in it, and we don't agree with it, we want to be like, we want to smack the donkey, right? We want to hit that donkey. <sighs> Why? You know, and I read these stories and my first immediate thought is it's so funny that people are dead set, right? The Bible is a historical book of fiction. It's folklore. It's myths. It's just stories to... You know, it's it's poetry. It's all of these things. People aren't like this anymore. It's not relevant. But then I read a story that was written by Moses. These are original Hebrew text here. First five books. Everybody believes those. Uh, and people haven't changed not one iota. People are still exactly the same as they were then. And we do the exact same things that we did then. We think that we know better. We think that we can manipulate God. We think that we, we think we're better, right? So we see that of Balak in us all that, you know, we want to appeal to our greed. It's, it's our nature to do so. But then we kind of see this other side, right? With Balaam, Balaam, where we're, we're challenged, right? Like he is already a follower of God because it's in his family line to do so. He's inquiring of the Lord He's giving the Lord's message for all intents and purposes of the word. This man is a prophet of the Lord. But we see, you know, we tend to think we elevate people with title. You know, we think that, oh, well, you're a prophet of the Lord. You are above sin. You are above reproach. You are above. And we, 
We ascribe these same kind of traits and characteristics to pastors and teachers, evangelists, to all of the things. You know, we tend to put those people above, but we see directly in the middle of Balaam doing exactly what he was instructed to do. Okay, God told him to go. And then God becomes angry with him and he teaches him this lesson. But what we see is Balaam learned the lesson, right? He gets it. He sees it. He understands. We never hear if he thinks about the fact that a donkey talked to him. I still think that's weird. But he understands. He gets it. And then ultimately later we get to see him use the knowledge that he learned from the lesson that the Lord taught him on the way and apply it as wisdom in the midst of what God had him there to do. And that was in the recognizing that the Lord was showing him something and being obedient to it. He was obedient to it. I love that it says, Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel and he did not resort to, to his sorcery. He didn't resort to himself. He didn't resort to what he knew. He submitted to the Lord. And then what happened? The spirit of the Lord came on him. And he no longer had to rely on himself, his own tactics, or what he knew. He simply looked out into the desert and the Lord spoke through him. I think that's great. So there's so many things we can see in this. And it's so many paths we could go down of just the opposite of seeing, you know, Balak, this worldly king, reliant on his possessions and his riches and his status and his position and his authority. But even in all of those things, none of those things influence the hand of God. And you cannot thwart God's mission or his plans or his purposes, not with your money, not with your power, not with your influence. It can't happen. And if you are obedient to the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you. And there ain't nothing better than that. So I hope you have enjoyed, um, I don't know, Bibleology with Jordan this morning. Uh, and I hope everybody has a great day.